Welcome to Many Talks Podcast, talking all business, entrepreneurship, property development, finance and investment. Reese Many here, your host of Many Talks. Got a fantastic guest with me today, Harry Redknapp. Harry, thanks for coming on. Harry's invited us down to his house. I mean, he doesn't need a lot of um, introducing, but, you know, very, very um, well known in the football industry. Um, he's a property developer by trade as well. And he's also um, been in some programs on ITV uh, that we're going to speak about later as well. So, Harry, thanks for having us down. Pleasure. No problem, Reese. Yeah. So, um, brief introduction, really, to our listeners and our viewers, just about what it was like growing up in the East End, really, yeah. um, to start off with. And then, how you, when you first got into football, what, what it was like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was great. It was a great place, you know, for me growing up. The East End of London was, was fantastic, yeah. you know. And we lived on, uh, we, you know, we, we, we got a, we had a little house where we lived upstairs in my great grandmother's sort of two rooms. But then we got a flat on a big council estate called Bedette Estate, and it was a, it was paradise really because there was hundreds of kids. You know, it was about eighteen big blocks of flats, mm. and in, in the middle was a school, with a playground, and we played football from morning till night really. And there was always plenty of kids to play with because so many of us yeah. a big estate, you know. But it was, yeah, it was great. People were fantastic. The East End of London was, was special, you know, and... Uh, was that where you first started playing football? Yeah, I played, yeah, played, and my dad was a good player. My dad was a, a prisoner of war, came back in the war, was a good non-league player. So that was, yeah, we were football mad. And my dad was a big Arsenal fan. He was a big gooner. <laughs> and so he used to take me to Arsenal. Yeah. So, like, you know, when I play in the morning at East London, and then he stopped playing, me dad. Um, and so we started, you take me to Arsenal, I play in the morning for East London schools and then in the afternoon we go and watch the Gunners play, you know. But he was, he was a real Arsenal punter, you know. We didn't have a car, we'd get the bus, get the 277 or 106 and we'd mm. change buses and get another bus, but every Saturday you take me to see And then at, at school, when was it that you sort of knew that you was... Well, early really, sort of, play, you know, I played with East London schools under 11s and then under... And then sort of playing and under, tw you know, I was under 12 or whatever, played a game at Millwall one day against, uh, I think it was Wanstead in the cup final, uh, East London boys versus Wanstead. And when I came off, there was a guy waiting uh, sort of by the tunnel area, uh, you know, very impressive guy. And he, he was the ex-captain of West Ham as a player, for a man okay. called Dickie Walker. Dickie had played at West Ham and centre half and when he finished at West Ham he didn't get a, he ended up a scout for Tottenham West Ham didn't have a job for him he ended up scouting for the Spurs mm. and Dickie said you know, is your dad here you know I'll have a chat with your dad and whatever no I was buzzing I went in the dressing room after you yeah, know West as a Tottenham scout you know and he invited me down to uh, met my dad after who had been at the game and said look we you know come down to Tottenham I'd like to show you around introduce you to Bill Nicholson mm. who's a probably Tottenham's greatest ever manager. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, a dour Yorkshireman, Bill Nick. And we go down and sort of, you know, I'm 12 years of age, whatever. Um, we get the train, get the, we walk to a, down to White Hart Lane and we meet Bill Nicholson, you know. And, How uh, did that feel? Amazing, you know, amazing. Surreal. The, yeah, because I was football mad, yeah. you know, I love football. And so to go and meet him and uh, then we used to get tickets uh, to go and watch all the games. He'd send me... In the post every week, we get two tickets to go and watch. So I followed that European team, Bobby Smith, and you know that team yeah. sort of saw all them games. And uh, yeah, it was great European nights at, uh, at Wild Lane. Um, yeah, and that's what happened. I played with East London boys, and then suddenly West Ham came in, and Chelsea, and Arsenal, and I could have gone to any of the clubs, you know. Um, and then just before I left school, I decided that really West Ham was a club that. And a big influence was a mate of mine who I played at East London Boys with, a goalkeeper called Colin McAworth. He was signing for West Ham and we were great buddies, you know. Uh, and it sort of, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I was half influenced because he's my mate and he's mm. going to West Ham. And, and also we, when we got invited to West Ham, meeting Ron Greenwood, uh, going to watch some youth games, he was at every game, like Bill Nick was. That was how managers were in them days. Managers would be at every youth game. They yeah. they knew that the future of every their football club was you 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 bought players out the youth team. It's not like now that you just go out and buy players mm. now. Back in them day, everybody Tottenham, 
West Ham, big percentage of the players would come, come from out the of youth. youth and they'd produce their own players. And West Ham was a conveyor belt, like probably like Tottenham was, but uh, of producing their own players. And anyway, I decided to join West Ham, so I left school and signed for the Because oh. the they had a fantastic academy at West Ham, they've always Great. been known for that. Yeah, they? and I went there at 15, and my first year, I leave school at 14, just for my 15th birthday. And my first season there as a 15-year-old, it's under 18 and a half competition. We won the FA Youth Cup. Mm. And so it was fantastic. We had three 15-year-old kids, which I know is difficult, very unusual to have 15-year-old kids, three of us playing in a team that wins the FA Youth Cup, under 18 and a half competition. But we're getting crowds of like 30,000 people. Yeah. I mean, at Upton Park, it was incredible, you know. And in the final, we played Liverpool who uh, Tommy Smith played for them, who was, who was in the first team and was an outstanding player in their first team. Um, and we, Johnny Sissons played in our team, who had already played in the cup, was played in the cup final at 17. Mm. And um, yeah, we, we, we go up to, to Liverpool, get beat 3-1 at Liverpool, come back half time with 2-1 down at home. So we're 5-2 down in aggregate and second half we scored four goals. We had a centre forward called Martin Britt, who was a fantastic header of the ball. Uh, and a real good player, and uh, he got four goals second half, and we won five, <laughs> six five. It was so it was a great, you know, it was a great club to go. And we was all kids from the same area. We all came from the East End of London, mm. or from Dagenham, or Barking in Essex. Everybody was homegrown. It were we didn't buy a player. Everybody came through the youth team. We'd What's all... the academies like now compared? N nothing. Compared no, to it's no, completely no. different. But right? people wouldn't. Uh, the manager. We played the semi-final of the FA Youth Cup against Wolves at Wolves, and the manager Ron Greenwood came with us that day to watch that semi-final and didn't go with the first team. Yeah. Now, can you imagine that? Now, never. He came to walk to Molyneux on the Saturday on the coach with the, with us kids and. Travelled up. That's the interest that he had in the kids. He knew that you know the foot future of the club is the youth producing kids. Yeah. Um, and that was how it was. And and I took that on when I became a manager. I went to every youth game. I'd watch every kids game. I'd go Saturday morning when I managed West Ham, and Saturday morning I'd go to Chabalief, watch the kids play for an hour. Uh, first half, 15 minutes. Second half, jump in my car to Upton Park for the first team game. Yeah. Never miss a game. So. That was it. That was, and that really, you know. Do you think it's yeah. a bit disappointing that it doesn't happen as much yeah. now? I know they things don't have even, changed. They don't even. After managers, most of them wouldn't even turn up and watch a youth game. Yeah. They don't even go. Got no interest. They wouldn't stop and look at the kids when they're training. Uh, that's how it's gone. Mm. But back in them days, I'd go to Old Trafford. Alex Ferguson would know every player, 12 year old. Harry, we've got an 11 year old kid here, he's fantastic. You know, Ravel Morrison, or whoever it might be. He want, mm. we've got, and he, he, like I was, he knew every kid. Yeah. Joe Cole at 11, I used to go and watch the under 12s play Saturday, Sunday mornings over at Chad Relief. Go every Sunday. Watch Rio come through, watch Frank and all them kids, yep. you know, Jermaine Defoe, all the boys that came through, Carrick, watch them all play as kids, you know. And uh, Do you think yeah. that's why clubs don't produce as much as they used to now? Yeah, they don't get the opportunity. There's so much talent. You go and watch an under-11 game, Chelsea or Tottenham or whoever's playing today, mm. and you'll see fantastic young kids. Now, what happens to them? Where do they go? You know, they get to a certain and they don't get a pr chance to progress. They go out and buy somebody and they get pushed aside and suddenly they train up. The, what, and what used to happen, we used to, the, the kids would train at the same ground as the first team. Yeah. So we'd be on a pitch here and they'd be on the next pitch, the youth team. Uh, and so the first team would be playing and you might have an injury or you need, suddenly you, you might be playing eight a side, you, suddenly you're going to have 11, semi six over, then six of the kids would come over and make up the numbers with the first team. What an experience so, for the yeah, kids. Yeah, experience and you got to know the kids, they were around the first team, they picked up habits off the first team, the first team players would talk to the kids, the kids would do their boots and they'd get a little Christmas box and they was... So they, didn't, they had a rapport with the first team players, yeah. you know. That don't happen. Now they train like 10 mile away somewhere where the academy might be. They don't get to see the first team. Mm. They've got no relationship with them. You know, and when I go to West Ham, there's all them players that are there that are all, you know, maybe you know, Bobby's there and, uh, and people like John Bond and all the players that were you know, senior players at the club were there 30 years of age and suddenly you're 15 and you're around them every day and you're yeah. just part of it, you're learning. Mm. And that was how it was, but uh, it's all changed now. Do you think it would come back or...? No, I no. don't think so. I think the foreign just managers, 
you know, they don't, they haven't got the, we grew up, it was part of our life, you know, that we came through as kids at 11 and 12, 13, we all came through that poli youth policy, that conveyor belt, and we, knows, we know that, you know, what it means to them kids, mm. now that, that, that's gone, you know, that's gone. So you had a, you had a great experience as a, a professional footballer, obviously. Yeah. Well, what did you prefer, being a manager or actually playing oh, the game? a player, for yeah. sure, yeah. I think when you're a player, you know, you're one of the lads, and I grew up, as I say, we had a great, it was great with Bobby, Jeff, Martin, all played in the World Cup winning team. Yeah. You know, to have three players playing the World Cup winning team at West Ham was incredible, you yeah, know? Yeah, of course. And they were great lads. They, there was no, no one was, they came back in the World Cup as though like, no, you know, well done lads, like, that was it, you know, let's go and have a drink or something. And, we, and off we went. It yeah, was no right. like, you know, no Billy Big Time. They didn't have a month off to recover from the World Cup. They'd probably come and play two days later after yeah. the final. That was how it was. You just got on with it, you mm. know? Yeah, it has uh, changed like that, the sport. Oh, it changed massively. And you part, we'd play on a Saturday at home at West Ham, and we'd, by quarter to six, up past five, we'd be around the black line in Plasto. Mm. And we'd go and have a drink. And we'd be in there, and our mates would be in there. The punt, they were punters. They'd been to the game. And the, they would have the music going, and we'd have to stay and have a drink for a couple of hours, you know? It was the same everywhere. Tottenham, all the great, the great Tottenham team, the Dave Mackays, and all. They had a little pub up the road, and Jimmy and Greaves, and they'd be up there mm. having a drink. They'd be the punters, and they were part, you were part of the people. And you wouldn't do that now. You wouldn't, they wouldn't come now and go and have a drink with the lad. punters, would they? They'd all no. foreign anyway. Yeah. They wouldn't. They wouldn't you know, do that. And they lived in a, we all lived in. You know, terraced houses. We all live near the ground. John Bond played at West Ham for 20 odd years. He lived 50 yards from the ground. You come out the ground, walk across the road, first there. turn on the left, there's Bondy's little house, mm. little terraced house. And that was where you lived. We had this, we, you know, we get married, we have a terraced house, little terraced house, like £6,000. We didn't live in big houses in them days. The players, yeah. the only person I knew that had a detached house, the only player was Bobby. Bobby bought a house at, uh, in Chigwell that was detached. <laughs> and it was like we thought it was the, it was the Ponderoad, the biggest house in the world. Yeah. I went past it about a year ago, and it ain't very big at all. <laughs> it's the smallest house in Chigwell. Well, what was he like as a person? Ah, uh, Moro, there was no one like Bobby. No one I've ever met in my life like Bobby. He yeah. was just such a... Uh, I could cry thinking about him. I mean, it does me in. You know, yeah. I just loved him so much. He was special. As a footballer, what, as, a, as a defender, mm. who would you say in today's game... Um, you know, remind you of him as a player? <sighs> Difficult. He was, he was just so... But if you went and watched him, if I said, you go and watch Bobby Moore play today, he's playing for West Ham, you'd have come back. You'd, I said, how big is he? You'd have gone 5'11". Well, really, not very big for a central defender. Quick? No, he can't run. Not quick, no. Good in the air? No, not really. No, not good in the air. You go, oh, well, I forget him. That's the end. But he had a football brain. He was... A second in front of everybody. He'd read the game. He used to go with the centre forward, and the centre forward, the big centre forward, he might play Win Davis or Ron Davis, who were great editors of the ball in them days, you know? And Bobby would come, go up like as though he's going to jump there, jump, flick it on, and Bobby had dropped off 10 yards as though he's going to catch it on his chest. He'd <laughs> be flicking it onto no one yeah. and more always get it and play, you know? But Bobby swore that, you know, I spent obviously a lot of time with him and. Uh, he swore that Malcolm Allison made him a player. Malcolm was the first team player at West Ham, captain of the club. Mm. Malcolm went on to be arguably the, one of the best coaches in the world. Uh, and Malcolm saw something in Bobby as a kid. In fact, Bobby wasn't get, probably going to get signed on. Malcolm used to take, drop it. Malcolm was a captain of the club, had a, had a, a terrible illness and came back and started coaching the kids Tuesday and Thursday nights at the ground. And he, he, he took a shine to Bobby. He thought Bobby was... He could see something in Bobby that no-one else probably could see. And um, He used to drop Bobby and another kid off at Barking on his way home. He had a little car, Malcolm. Um, and when they'd come to leaving school, the coaches... He wasn't... He was, you know, he was only doing it part-time. And the coaches, there was like eight places or whatever available on the ground staff, as they were then, apprentices. Uh, and it was between Bobby and another kid for the last place. They had seven who they, they thought were certainties to get a place. Uh, and they were going to take this other lad. And Malcolm said, no, no, you take him. I'm telling you, take him, he'll be a player. And they went, he can't run, Malcolm, he can't. He said, I'm telling you, he'll be a player, you take him. 
He's, he's, and they, Malcolm was such a powerful man, powerful mm. character. And they took him and, you know, obviously what he did and what he achieved. But Malcolm believed in him. He had someone who believed And he said, Malcolm, without Malcolm, I never would have made it. He believed yeah. in me. And he talked to him every day about, you know, about his game and, you know, do this and why, why don't you do it? I told you, do that and drop off here and, you know, play from the back and pass it. And, and someone believing in you is so yeah. important. Whatever you do in life, I think to have someone believe in you, it's so important, and it doesn't matter what business you're in. Someone thinks, hey, you've got, you know, take an interest in you. And that don't happen enough. I think too often we herd them all together, youth coaches, 16 kids, they'll come in. Do we get to know them as individuals? What makes them tick? Have they got problems at home? How's their family life? Is the mum, is the dad out boozing and causing a problem? How's your life? How are the, or you're in digs, how's your digs? Are you getting looked after? How's the food? How's this? You know, take an interest in them, and I think that is important. I think that's a, a real big uh, fact there, as you said, in, in all aspects of life. Absolutely. Somebody being interested someone and giving some guidance, you. believes That's, in you. Yeah, someone gives you the opportunity. You're, you're, some see, say, hey, I like that. You're, yeah. you're do, hey, do it. I'm going to do a bit of extra work for you this afternoon. You're a coach. I'm going to get you back, come back in. I'm going to do some work on you on your passing or your whatever. Tell someone what they need to, and, and work and mm. take an interest in what they're doing. And, and I don't think there's enough of that. Yeah. I think it's like everyone's grouped together, do some passing drills. Like, okay, off you go. You know, I think that's just not in football, that's across the board. In, in as life, well. absolutely. I mean, obviously, just talking about, we can see, see that obviously talking about him gets you, mm. gets you emotional as well. What, how did he leave such an effect on you? I know he was such a player, but obviously... I, well, when you, I went to the... He was just like, everybody looked up to him. Yeah. He had this aura about him that was it's strange to... He was just class, yeah. Bobby. He just... And he was... I never heard him have a bad word for anybody. Mm. He so on and off the pitch. It, ah, he wasn't. He wasn't nasty. He never used to get booked. He never kicked. He just played. You know. Mm. He just read the game, made it look simple. Uh, and I got a picture in the other room. That great picture of him and Pele. Yeah. I mean, what an iconic picture. And I, you know, a, a story. I went when I went to America and played at Seattle. We um, uh, there was a bicentennial tournament. I'm playing at Seattle with Bobby and Jeff and uh, and. and um, it, it was a, te- uh, a bicentennial tournament, England, Italy, uh, Brazil, uh, England, Italy, Team America and Brazil played in this f- four-team tournament in America and they picked the team called Team America. It wasn't America, it was t- from the league. Mm. It wasn't American players, it was the best 11 players in, in the, the league. league. Yeah, Bobby captained that team and they played Brazil in Seattle and I was at the game and I'm sitting at the upstairs watching the watching the game, and at the end of the game, it was in Revelino, who was a superstar, Revelino, he would have drooped in moustache, used to do the step overs, send people 10 yards the wrong way and smack it in the top corner and 30 yards. You know, one of the greatest players in the world. Uh, at the end of the game, one of the Amer- team American players, a boy called Keith Eddie actually, played at Watford, goes running over to Revelino, wants his shirt, and Revelino sort of, I thought, well, it's, you know, a bit, I was sit, I'm watching this happen. I thought, oh, yeah, it's a bit strong. He won't give me a shirt. You know, he, he went, no, 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 you know, shook, shook out. No. With that, he turned and he sprinted 80 yards up the pitch, and I mean sprinted, tapped Bobby on the shoulder on the and begged Bobby for his shirt. And yeah. Bobby, you know, he swapped shirts, had a cuddle. And I thought, my God, it shows you just what, what he yeah. is. Yeah. So, talking about that, saying about him and, and Pele, there's a story when you was a manager, fast tracking here. Uh, one of your players got injured, and the physio. <laughs> the, the, is, is it a true story? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The physio. You yeah, asked the physio, can he can, can he, he carry play on? Us, yeah. He said his concussion. He don't know who he is. You went piss. tell him he's Pele. Yeah, he's he don't know who he is, Harry. He don't know who he is. Yeah. <laughs> I did tell him he's fucking Pele. <laughs> <laughs> and put him up front. Get him out. Yeah. So just fast forwarding. Obviously, now we spoke about when you was younger and playing. When you was a manager, let's let's talk about Tottenham going into Tottenham. You know what what was it like going in there as a manager? Yeah, it was great. I mean, you know, I'd had a, I'd had ten years at Bournemouth. Yeah, uh, that was where I started for me, and that was that was a great experience. We had no training ground. We used to train in the park. We'd get thrown off the park in the morning. We'd start training. The, the park keeper would come round on his bike and throw us off. <laughs> uh, you're not allowed on here. I had a right back called Tommy Effenham, was an Irish boy, Tommy, good player. Hard as now was my God. 
he was at Tottenham as a kid yeah. with Stevie Perryman and and uh, and they tell the story, you know, Tommy's party piece was heading the cricket ball, right? <laughs> he, I swear you asked Stevie Perriman, he could they used to Tommy had a he was a big lad and like he they used to he was a big Irishman and it, he used to head the crit right so the then when the park keeper would come round on his bike and Tommy would let his tires down and I said, Tommy that ain't helping us that ain't helping our calls, you know what I mean? We, he's yeah. throwing us I'm saying like come on mate, please, you know, we we've got a game Saturday, we need to train no, no, you're not allowed on here. Off, uh, no, you're not. You shouldn't be on here. Oh, and Tommy would be letting his tyres down. Oh. but no, that was it. Was it was very different days. And uh, but that was that was a great time for me because you know I was into management, watching games every night, yeah. driving everywhere, picking up, going to drive into Newport, signing Tony Pulis, you know, on a free transfer, going to look at him play. When I get there, it took me about four hours to get to Newport. It's raining, every game's being called off that night. And Tony's been dropped and he's sitting here. I'm going to a little shed for a cup of tea before the game. And Tony's sitting in there and I'll come to watch him, you know. I end up tapping him up instead and signing him on a free. But <laughs> that was how it was. Every night was, you know, off watching games, trying to find players on frees and yeah. build a team at Bournemouth. And, and that's what I did. And that, that was a... Great, great time in my life. Great start for me, you know, 10 years here. Um, and then obviously I went to West Ham and uh, had seven years here. Um, Portsmouth was great, great for me. And then ended up uh, getting the Tottenham job, yeah. And, so, and, and talking about the Tottenham job, obviously you, you've been with a lot of players there, some good players. Yeah. Gareth Bell, just Amazing. retired. Um, fa fantastic players. I, I thought he should have continued. Um, yeah. I think he still had a couple of seasons oh, in him. Absolutely, yeah, I'm surprised he packed up, really. Yeah. You know, I even thought when he came to Tottenham a couple of years ago that he still had more to offer. He didn't get a lot of opportunity to play, did he? No. Mourinho didn't seem to pick him very often. But then when he left Mourinho at the end of the season, he suddenly, you know, he Started scored playing. a couple at Leicester. A couple was, he had a great run of scoring. But um, I suppose you've got to take some credit for, uh, for his... You know, the way that he, he come through at Tottenham, he started off well, as a, a left-back yeah, and yeah, you yeah, pushed he him a, forward. He, he was a great left-back. He'd have been a bit of, you know, oh, he'd have gone on to be the best left-back in the world, then he'd become the best left-winger in the world, didn't he? So, but no, he was amazing. What did you see like, in him to push him uh, forward? Like, he yeah. just, he had that ability to, I mean, he was unplayable, wasn't he? Yeah. Pick it up and run 80 yards with it, you know. She could shoot, he could edit, he could do absolutely everything. Unbelievable the size of him. You can't believe the size. You know, he's six foot three, he's got shoulders out here. He just, he was just a powerhouse. Who yeah. could, he had everything, you know. But we had great players at Tottenham. You know, I'd, it was an exciting team. I had two wingers in, I had him and Aaron Lennon, who was jet propelled, quick, and go at people. Then you've got people like Luka Modric, Rafa van der Vaart. They were fantastic. Who was the most talented player that you, you managed at Tottenham? Um, Luka Modric was a great player. Yeah, you know he, he was a great man, fantastic person, not a minute's problem. Family man, train hard, never moan about anything, and just you couldn't get near him, could you? You just make your play, and eyes in the back of his head. You know, and when I went there, he played. He was playing out on the left, mm. and I remember playing. You know, I said I'm going to play him central against Arsenal. I'd only been there a couple of weeks. And uh, I played him in the middle of the park and the, the coaches who were there said he can't play there, he'd get murdered there, he's not strong enough, you know. And he played there and never never looked, never back, looked back, you know. So you'd say he's the, the, the most natural, talented player. Um, obviously, you've managed quite a few players. Who yeah. would you cast? I know you probably put Crouchy up there, but who would you say was the funniest footballer that you've, you've managed? Well, Crouchy was a character, they were, you know, it's it was different days, wasn't it? You know, the, the, you had days where things happened. You know, the, the lads were were lads, and they were, you know, even at Tottenham. You know, when I'd done a press conference at Christmas, and they were talking about the Christmas. I said, no, there, there are no Christmas parties here this year. We're getting, we're we're going well. We're second in the league or whatever. Uh, there's no. They can have their Christmas party at the end of the year. No one's going out drinking here this year. You know, at Christmas. Uh, what I didn't know, they'd gone out the night before, and uh, <laughs> and they was pictures of them blind drunk, laying, like, ledly laying on the floor, you know. <laughs> uh, and they'd gone to Dublin, and I didn't know anything about it. And I'm saying, no, there will be no Christmas parties. <laughs> oh my God! Crap. How, how did you deal with that when when you found out? Well, I just gave him a rucking. I mean, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't bother to find. I, I wasn't into finding players. It was a last resort, really, yeah. to find them, you know. 
Um, because, you know, it's different. If you can find them and give the money to charity, I think it's worth doing. But if you're only going to give it back to the club, you know, I'd rather let them keep it yeah. and let's see. But <laughs> give them a bottle, yeah, I think give them a ruck in and let, they, they know he took the liberty. But uh, I think Robbie was behind it, Robbie Keane, who... Robbie was a great character, but I think Robbie was took him, took the lads to Dublin for the day. So, so just um, as well, you've you've had Crouchy and Defoe mm. um, in your team. If you had to pick one of them, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's they a were tough both great. For you, yeah, aren't they? yeah, little and large, weren't they? <laughs> they were perfect. What a pair, you know. It Crouchy, drop it down, Defoe smack in the back of the net. It was quite simple, really, isn't it? <laughs> it ain't <laughs> rocket science. It ain't yeah. rocket science. <laughs> you know, when you get the ball, lads, it, it Crouchy on the diagonal. Uh, Crouchy knocks it down and Defoe's getting around him and uh, smacking it in the back. Yeah, it was, it was quite simple. It was nothing. If, you had to, if you had to pick one? Oh, difficult. Jermaine was an amazing goal scorer, wasn't he? A great finisher. And I signed Jermaine as a schoolboy, obviously. You know, as when he left school, he came and took him to West Ham as a, as a kid and uh, loaned him out to Bournemouth, you know, again. Uh, you know, Mel Machin, the manager of Bournemouth, rang me. They were bottom of the league, and he said, Harry, we're struggling, we're going to get relegated. You know, you, you haven't got anybody there, we need a striker, you ain't got anyone can help us. So if you were struggling for money, I said, Yeah, I've got a kid here, you can have Mel on loan. He, uh, he said, How old is he? I said, He's 17. Oh, no. He said, Harry, it's, you, know, you know this league, it's a men's league, you know. How big is he? I said, About five foot six. I'll leave off, he said to me. I said, no, I'll tell you what I do. I said, I'm sending him down. Don't loan him. He said, I've only got one loan left. And that's it. You know, we, if I make a ricket, if he, I said, Look, I'll tell you what I do. I send him down. Let him train me here for a week. I tell him three or four days. I tell him he's just coming down with a bit of experience. He, I said, he's a great lad. He, he'll do whatever. I said, have a look at him and see what you think. Anyway, he went and trained. He rung me mail at about two o'clock in the afternoon. Harry, can we loan him for the season? <laughs> well, what's happened? He said, we had a practice match this morning. He got five goals. I went, yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> take, 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 him, take him. And he took him. You're obviously yeah. talking about loaning people out. Obviously, you remember Harry Kane signing his first professional mm. contract at Tottenham. Um, he went on loan as well. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah, and you, you think that's what's made him the player that it he is? Certainly, I think it... I love the loan system, you know. It's funny, I did a... I played in a golf day with Barry Hearn. Mm. Uh, and he stood up at the end and did a little speech and took the mickey out of everybody about our golf. We had England versus Scotland, like ten aside. It was great, great crack it was. Anyway, Barry started, he said, it's lovely to have Harry here today. He said, and I always owe Harry a big favour. When he was at Tottenham, I rang him up from, I was at Leighton Orient, chairman. He said, and we were bottom of the league, you know, struggling, going to get relegated. And I said, Harry, look, have you got a, any players we can loan? We ain't got any money, can't even pay the wages, really. And he said, yeah, I've got a couple of kids who are doing good. You know, I'm not worried about their wages, just take them, you know. He said, no, I said, all right, oh, great. Oh, well, you know, he said, he loaned us Harry Kane, uh, Ryan Mason and Andros Townsend. He said, and they came in, he said, we shot up the league, he said. And he said, but if you'd have said to me uh, what chance they got playing at the top, I said, well, Andros Townsend's got a chance, you know. He, Ryan Mason, yeah, yeah, he could do, you know, good player, good. He said, Harry Kane, no, he never played for Tottenham. Good lad, but he won't get never good enough to play for Spurs. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. He says, shows you what I know, he said. <laughs> Just talking about Kane, obviously, been at Tottenham. So, you know, he's, he's, he is where he is. There's talk at the minute of uh, maybe him moving on. I know he spoke openly that he wants to win things. What's, what's your take on I it, don't Dave? think he'll move. I think he's here now. I think he... I can't see him moving. No. I think he's... No, I, just, I think he'll end, up, he'll end up being a Gerard or sort of one club man, like you know, and and stick stick there. And uh, I think his life's great, and it? he's a big fish. He's the best centre forward in the world. I think he's the best centre forward in the world. Mm. He's fantastic. He can do everything. You know, he leads. He, he he works. He's a leader. He scores. He can shoot. He can edit. He passes it like a midfield player. Yeah. Links play up. He, what? He's big, strong. He can do everything. He's just a complete all-round player. Uh, and a good good lad. Not a minute's problem. Gets on with it. Gets on with it, yeah. Family he, man. He, he can play. He has got everything. And that's why I suppose there is the talk of him moving. Because yeah. he can walk into Any to team. most teams, can't he? Yeah. But does he need to? He's, he's, the money he's earning there is more money he can ever spend, probably. Mm. You know, he's earned that. He would be earning a fortune, quite rightly so. Um, I think he's, you know, he's moving house or building a new house or whatever. 
I don't know. His life's probably great. He, he loves his golf. I think that's his hobby now. He's not, you know, when he can, he gets a game of golf in. Mm. Um, I, I, I can't see him wanting to move away. He's a family. His brother looks after him. It's a family affair, I think, more than anything now. So well, I, I think there's a lot of people praying that you're right. <laughs> yeah, I think he'll stay. I can't <laughs> he's going to stay. Though. That's good. Um, just a couple of more questions yeah. on football. Um, one that, you know, probably I don't want to ask, but Arsenal are playing well this season. Yeah. Um, how do you see it playing out? I think Arsenal are playing fantastic, aren't they? I mean, that's the football they're playing. It, and the team just looks so well balanced, you know? The, the two great wingers. Um, you know, they're strong in midfield. Odegaard looks a real player, you know. Mm. I, I love the way he plays, he's just class. Uh, and they look solid at the back, the keeper's good. Oh, I don't know, I've still got a feeling Man City are going to win it. I've still got a feeling Man City are going to come with a rattle and, and pip them. But it's going to be tight. Arsenal are going to take, they're going to take some catching, but... The they're one team you wouldn't want chasing you down is Man City, <laughs> City isn't it? Yeah. If it was someone else behind them, you'd yeah. be going, well, you know, yeah. But they're so dangerous, aren't they? Look how they turned it around the other night, second half, you know. And look at his bench the other night. Yes, you know, it's a dangerous like, bench. Crazy, isn't it? Diaz, Foden, all these people don't get a game. And they can it, walk into most teams. Any team, you know, yeah. any team. You know, he's, look at the, the choices he's got everywhere. It's just, it's ridiculous. So... I just think strength in depth. If Arsenal get a couple of injuries, could be a problem for them, you know? Mm. So, moving on from football, obviously, you're, you're a wise investor away from the game. You've got into... Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. You know the game, sometimes, yeah. Some you win, some you lose. Yeah. So, what, what is it that you, you do outside of the game in terms of um, investing? Is you a well, stocks we build, man, you're in no, property? No, we build, yeah, anything. I'm a gambler, and I? Uh, we build houses and flats down here. Okay. Um, you know, I, I work with my son, he runs it for me, really, Mark. And uh, so, yeah, we, we do okay. We yeah. build some nice, nice houses and nice, nice properties, flats, and different stuff. You know, we've got a lot, of, got a lot on the go at the moment. Yeah. So, how did you get into that? Just um, I built a house first for myself. You know, when I was a uh, a player down here. You know, um, when I finished playing and became the manager. I had a mate of mine who was a builder and he's, you know, he said to me, there's a plot for sale, Harry, why don't you build yourself a house? You know, I never thought about it and we did it. Um, and then sort of just got into it, really. But I'll be honest, I invest more, I, I, I'm not that hands-on. Yeah. You know, I, I back it, I fund it, but they get on and, Harry, look, you know, we've got this, and I go and look at it and say, yeah, I like that, you know, we can, mm. we can get four flats on here, or we can knock this house down and put two on here, or do whatever we're doing. Yeah, OK, yeah, great. And I'll leave it to them, you know, as long as they keep showing me a little bit of yeah. profit and everybody's happy, I'm fine. Do you, do you think that, not just in football, but as as people grow in, in their self, they should look to people that are making money or have got disposable income, look to be investing and looking at different angles for, you know, when retirement absolutely, comes? Absolutely, because... yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, so many footballers, sportsmen over the years, boxers, you know, End up skin. Mm. Um, it's a, I mean, there was a stat, wasn't there, about footballers a few years ago that 50% go bankrupt by in five years of finishing or something yeah. crazy. Bad advice, you know, people advise putting them into, into bad things that suit them, where they're getting money out of it, putting the players into stuff. We're gullible. We've got probably after players, you know, we've come out of the game, you know, with not great educations really. You know, mm. wanted to be a footballer since we was little kids, and really education didn't come, and not in every case, but in lots of cases. So, and really know nothing else. But and suddenly someone said, "I'll oh, buy a wine bar, I'll buy something else, or do this, or do that, or invest." Even Bobby, we go back to Bobby. Bobby was invested in so many rubbish things, and had so many people really rip him off. It was mm. scary. It was unbelievable, and ended up really. Not a wealthy man, yeah. Uh, which you know, just badly advised, really. No one to, to. And I think of... that has an effect on the sports world, doesn't it? Because yeah. they have had such bad advice, yeah. then people are worried what to do, and they're not sure what to do. Absolutely, you know, it's you don't know what you leave. I when I finished playing, I, I finished at Bournemouth. I was trying to buy a Bournemouth taxi, uh, but I didn't have the money. It was fourteen grand. Uh, and I went to the bank, tried to borrow the money, and they wouldn't loan it to me. I couldn't get a loan. 
And that was my only that was my only future. I had nothing. I come out, you know, finished playing here. Where do you go from here? Mm. Uh, what do we do? Um, yeah, and that was it. I was, you know, gonna gonna buy a cab, and, but yeah, I buy the plate, and they say it was it was fourteen between fourteen and fifteen thousand pounds at that time, but couldn't couldn't afford to do it. And you think, well, how are we gonna survive? What what can I do? I can't do nothing. I've got no education really, and mm. I've got no uh, no real skills to go and work. And you know, what can, where's my next step? It was a scary time, mm. you know. And then suddenly someone comes along, and you get a break. Uh, and you know, uh, Bobby comes. You know, I get a, go to America and play, and then Bobby gets a job, goes to Oxford, and I go to Oxford City. It's only part time, but it was still a living. Drive into Oxford every day from Bournemouth. They give me a little club car, a little eleven uh, uh, Fiesta eleven hundred or whatever it was, and nine nine fifty. Sorry, I blew that up in about eight months doing <laughs> doing going too quick in it. And um, but up every day driving to. Oxford and back every day. I'd be there at nine o'clock, leaving home here at seven, getting up there, training at night time, sometimes getting home at midnight, back up again next morning, back to Oxford again. Yeah. 90 quid a week I was getting. But that was how it was. And I think but I think you appreciate things when you've you've had nothing and you've had to struggle to make things. You appreciate life. You, mm. And I that's how I am, really, I think. You know, when you've grown up with uh, very little, and he, you know, you've had to work and fight for everything. I think it's a big help. No one gave me anything. We didn't, no. you know, the, them days were different. We didn't go our holiday. My holiday was op picking with my nan, six weeks going down in Kent, picking ops every day up in the morning at five o'clock down the op fields. My nan picking ops, rain, whatever. That was how it was, mm. you know, very different. So now when you go abroad and go on lovely holidays, you, you appreciate it. Yeah, Harry, when we was off, off camera, we was talking about um, you when you were a manager at Oxford. Quite a good story that you told us that um, I think it'd be good for, for the listeners yeah, yeah. to know. When somebody was giving you a bit of stick when you was the manager there. Yeah, um, I was, yeah, I was managing West Ham and uh, we went for a pre-season to open the Oxford City's new stadium. Nice little stadium, about 4,000 people there that night. Lovely sunny evening. And I was getting the dugout and there's a guy next to the dugout. He's got West Ham earrings, West Ham tattooed up his arms, up his legs, got his shorts on it, hammers on his legs. He started on making the first whistle. Redknapp, when are you going to get a strike, a Redknapp? When are you going to sort it out? When are you going to do something about it? All through the first half, he's slaughtering me. Anyway, we get a couple of half-time, make three substitutions. We had, what we'd done, we took two, we had two games that night. Frank Lampard Senior took a team down to Billericay or somewhere and I took the team to Oxford. So we had like 13, 14 players in the squad, you know. Half time I made this substitution, so we've got no more subs. Anyway, he started on it. We suddenly we get an injury, so I turned to the guy who was giving me all the grief and I said, Oi, big mouth, can you play as good as you talk? He said, Why? <laughs> I said, Come, you're playing. He said, What do you mean? I said, You've got any. He said, I ain't got any. What do you mean I'm playing? I said, Come, you play at West Ham. We, we need. Well, he said, I ain't got any boots. I said, What size are you? He said, Nines. I said, The old kit man, Eddie. Got any size? He said, We've got a load of boots in there, yeah. Go on, go and get changed. Off he goes. Anyway, he comes back, he's got feet like that, 10 to 2 feet. He's waddling up the touch, he's got skin, all his ear tattoos all over him. So he's, Where do you want me to play? I said, Well, better go up front. Because he kept telling me, like, when are we going to get a centre forward? Chapman's no good. We need a new centre forward. Chapman's no good. So, any. Anyway, he comes on, he plays up front, he scores a goal, doesn't he? I must be, and he was better than Chapman that night, I must be true. <laughs> and he got a goal as well. And he scored as well. Oh, <laughs> Did he ask for a contract? He was running. Like... Well, the funny <laughs> thing was, we had a photographer at West Ham called Stevie Bacon. And Stevie got all the pictures that night of him coming on. And next day in the sun, Stevie had a result because there was two page spread of this geezer playing. Fan plays for West Ham, made a big, you know. So he become famous overnight, this punter. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, we're we're nearly. It's been a it's been a great chat, and thanks for being so open Pleasure, with us and, and so honest. I mean, ju just going back to uh, pulling it back from football and and everything. You know, the whole idea of this podcast is to give back to people that might be at a crossroads in life, might be you know coming out of school, not sure what to do sure, with their I life. Sure, I've been there. Um, that's what I'm saying. You've been there, or, or might be going through the academy at the moment and mm. feel like they're putting everything into being a professional footballer. But, 
you know, they're at, a, they're at an academy, yeah. but it's not ticking for them. What's, what's the best bit of advice that you could give to anybody in that situation? Well, to a footballer, I would say uh, to, to practice. The harder you practice, the more you spend on the train, you know, it, the better you get. You've got, to practice, you've got to work hard at it. And, you know, the, the people that I've had, like Jermaine, and who would, you know, Jermaine Defoe would finish after training and be out there. It ain't coincidence suddenly every, you know, he's, he's, hitting, he's hitting 40, 50 shots out of training. Frank Lampard would, would do his sprints because he wasn't quick and he'd be shooting from 20 out on his own. And, you know, even Harry Kane would be the same. You know, he'd be out there after training, go and do 20 minutes of finishing. You know, and and, the, and that's what you have to do. The great golfers, the Tiger Woods, don't just hit, look, come walk on the golf course. They're out there practicing. They'll be out there for hours. And then after they've finished playing, they're back on the driving range or doing, you know, work at it, practice, and and want to be. You can be whatever you want to be if you work at it. Yeah. Uh, it's put. You know, it's having that desire to do it. it putting the work you know, in. Putting the work in. Don't think you. Oh, I've become a footballer. I've got a pro contract. Oh, I'm. Rep I've made it now. You know, be the last one off the training ground, not the first. Go and yeah. want to do the extra yards, you know? And it's like everything in life, isn't it, really? Mm. Whatever you do and you want to succeed, you've got to graft. Yeah, no yeah. one's going to give you anything. You've got to put the work in. That's your main... It. Whatever you whatever you do, whatever you've you got to put the hours in, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, thanks. Thanks. Please, Some pleasure. great advice for, for people that, that are listening. Um, it's been fantastic Good having you on. To you. And... Um, I have actually sat in your office at, at um, West Ham when you was the manager there. Right. I was um, I was there training with Les Seely. Okay. So yeah, Les Seely. I was a goalkeeper back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, I was sat in your Les, office. When... Les was a character. <laughs> yeah, he was a. Oh, it was sad losing Les at that age, 40, 41, I think he was when yeah. he went. Yeah, Les, he was. I, I was there just then. That's just as Rio got um, sold to Leeds. Yeah, yeah. So it was that that, right. that evening that he went. Right. I was in the I was in the change rooms van on ah, when he when he went. Yeah. Bloody hell. So yeah, good what days. was that like when he went when he went there? When he went to Leeds, Rio. We, yeah. oh, we told we tried to beg him not to go. Me and, <laughs> me and Frank, to be honest, me and Frank Lampard said, look, don't go. You know, there'll be another. I think he got pushed into it a little bit. His agent wanted him to go or try to. Obviously, it was a pay date for him. And the club were quite happy to sell him, I think, you know, at the time. I think Terry Brown, the chairman at West Ham, he felt that the Bosman ruling had come in and he said to me, there'll never be another big transfer. This is because everybody will be freeze. Mm. They'll play their contracts out, so there won't be any transfer. Uh, but he was obviously completely wrong yeah. because <laughs> you look at the transfer. <laughs> you see what's going yeah. on there, yeah. But, and I think he thought getting that 18 million for Rio, it would never sense. happen again. But yeah. It's yeah. a shame. Yeah. He, obviously, his career went on from moving. Oh, yeah, fantastic. But, I mean, look at the players that West Ham have produced. Yeah. Carragher, Joe Cole, course, Ferdinand, yeah. Yeah, Jermaine. Oh, yeah. yeah, You know, course. there's plenty that have come Glenn, through. Glenn Johnson, all, all, yeah. Why do you think that is at West Ham? Just... Well, it wasn't always like that. We had that spell when I went there as manager. They'd gone about 11 years without... The, the last one, I think, before that was would have been Incy and Stevie Potts mm. and Cotty. And then they, they went, and then there was a big gap for maybe 10, 11 years where they might have got one or two, played a few games, and but no one really who went on to become a big player, you know? And then suddenly out of what we end up having that little group come all at once, mm. six kids all come through, all went on to become big stars, yeah. play for England and whatever, you know, internationals. Unfortunately, not for West Ham. West Ham yeah. sold them all, you know? <laughs> yeah. Which was a shame if they'd have kept them. Imagine if you had them six in your team, you know, it was Sky's crazy, the limit. wasn't it? You know, Glenn Johnson and, you know, Joe was genius, Joe Cole, you know, Jermaine, Frank, Rio, Michael Do you, do you think Joe hit where he should have hit? Uh, no, I suppose I thought Joe would be, he could have been like maybe, you know, one of the best players in the world. Mm. He was actually. You spoke very highly of him. He was all that the way good. Through. As an 11 year, 12 year old, I've never seen anything like it. It was crazy how good he was. Uh, but I, I just think when he went to Chelsea, he won every, he won everything. He played for England lots of times. Mm. He had a great career. But you know, I just wonder whether when he went to uh, Chelsea, he suddenly got put into a position. I think Joe was a was a number ten. He was a player really. You you just let him play. Go and, Joe, wherever the ball is, go and get on the ball. You know, like Messi gets it where he wants to be, doesn't he? He stands still and he will walk in a position here or play. 
go and get it wherever you want to be. Just go and get the ball and make us win the game. Do something for us, you know? Mm. Uh, and I think he went to Chelsea, ended up playing wide, um, the track back. And I remember him playing at Fulham one day. And I think about 30 minutes into the game, him and uh, I think it was Sean Wright Phillips might have been on the other. They both got subbed when they were getting beat at Fulham, Chelsea. Uh, but because he, you know, and he wasn't tracking back or whatever. You know, that wasn't his game. Joe, Joe was a, just a free player, you know, he was, he was, he was the best schoolboy player I'd seen. Mm. Yeah. Well, look, just to flip it up, last question I've got for yeah. you. Um, being on ITV, celebrity, get me yeah, out of here. Yeah, yeah. Being, being the people's champ, what was it like? What was the experience it like? It was all right. I'd never seen the programme, you know. I'd never seen one second of it, I swear. And when I got asked to do it, they obviously paid me decent money. And, you know, my wife said to me, you've got to watch it, Harry. You don't know what you're doing. You don't get any... I said, oh, of course, it, you won't get any food in it. I said, of course, it, but there'd be a caravan out there. But it's only a bloody TV programme. You go up and have a bacon sandwich, come back and a cup of tea and make out, oh, I'm starving, you know. I said, it's only a... She said, I don't, I don't think you do. And she was right. It was, it was pretty... Uh, it was worse nothing. than it looks. <laughs> oh, no. It was, but it was good for, in the end. But you, you get into it and they were nice people. I, I didn't know them. You know, they was all people I'd never met before. And so it was... It was and they were nice. It was a good experience. It was interesting, you know? Yeah. You enjoyed it? I enjoyed it at the time, yeah. Would you do it again? No. No, once <laughs> was enough. I kept, yeah... All doing them trials and all oh, the worst thing you can do. I kept saying, I hate rats. I'm scared of rats. So they 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 hear that and so and they, they give they, you the rat challenge. Yeah, I <laughs> didn't know that because I'd never seen it. And then the last thing I ended up with about forty rats crawling all over me. You know, so you, that that is what happens here. Yeah. Well, look, Harry, thanks a Pleasure. lot again. Thank you very it was much. Good for talking to you. you. Nice talking to you.